So if I remember right, we concluded yesterday talking about cookies and, and bcrypt um, for hashing passwords. I think that's where we ended up. Um, I did a quick section in here about base64 encoding because I'm like, oh, we, we, we do need to talk about that briefly, um, which I meant to get in there, but hadn't yet. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what it is and, and how it fits into the maybe the broader picture of the things that we're covering here. Um, and part of that is that oftentimes when you're dealing with encryption or if you're dealing with um, hashing, that generally gives you out a um, byte array or, or um, of some sort um, because you usually get binary data and not text data back after it's been encrypted. Um, so that's that's kind of the norm. And then, well, what do you do with with binary data? Because most of the times, if we're getting data from our users, um, we're getting it as, as like text or numbers and such. Um, so unless we've been taking data in as files, we, we usually don't have to deal too much with binary data. Okay. Um, so, so Base64 encoding is a tool to kind of work with that. Um, in JavaScript, specifically in Node, um, there's an object called the buffer, uh, a buffer object, a buffer class. Um, buffer objects are used to represent a fixed length of sequence, fixed length sequence of bytes. Um, so you can kind of think about it as like a byte array that you might have in C Sharp um, or, or Java. Um, so a, a byte array would be an array of, of bytes. So a buffer, you can kind of think of it as, as an array of bytes. That's basically what it is. Um, it's a fixed length, so you can't increase or decrease it. Once you allocate the space, the, the size of it is fixed. Now, in general, buffers and byte arrays can't be simply just, con you can't just convert them to strings. Um, you can't just say to string and, and magically have it magically have it appear or or put it usually you can't put it into your JSON and just oh it works right um, so there are oftentimes some things you have to do when you're working with buffers um, and especially if you need to transfer that data around um, if we convert the if we were to say let's take this byte array and, and convert it byte bit for bit to a string um, often time, what, what, what's required, however you do it, is you have to have some sort of encoding. Um, you have to say, use this encoding to turn the data into a string. Um, so oftentimes, one of the, you know, the most common encoding that you've seen is like UTF-8, um, where you basically, most characters are a single byte, okay? Um, so if you take that encoding, um, where each character is a byte, you could think, well, I'll just call, I'll take those bytes and call them characters and be done with it, right? Um, but as it turns out, there's a lot of nuance actually to how that encoding works. So for instance, in a byte, how many bits does it have? It has eight bits, right? Um, yeah. And in UTF-8, if that top bit, um, the highest bit is set to one, um, that means that this character is more than one character long um, the, or more than one byte long. Um, so what that means is if you have numbers in there, if you have bytes in there where the first bit is set, so they're 128 or bigger, um, then they have an interpretation that's you know maybe not intended if it's just random uh, encrypted data. Right, because those aren't meant to be characters. Um, so oftentimes, if you take a byte array and try to directly encode it with UTF-8, you're going to find that you get an error, um, or UTF-16, whatever encoding you take, you're going to get an error because those are not valid characters. Because um, not all number sequences are valid strings. Um, so, or valid byte sequences are not valid. Um, so you can get an exception if you try to convert it to UTF-8. So that's not something we want to do. Um, even when it does work, um, you still tend to introduce special characters and 
because you're basically dealing with the sequence of random numbers, you don't know what special characters you're going to get out. You could get any special character out of that conversion, right? So, for instance, what might be a character that might cause us some problems if we were to pull it out? Probably some quotes, right? That might cause us some, some issues um, later on if we wanted to do things with, um, we might have to escape that. Um, so you can you can some takes sometimes take buffers and convert them directly to strings um, using a UTF-8 encoding, but only if they were encoded originally that way. They originally started as a string, and you you encoded them as UTF-8. You can then unencode them and bring it back. Um, but you don't want to just take arbitrary data encoded as UTF-8. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah, when will we use this? I'm, I'm trying to picture, like, I'm warming up here from yesterday and buffer. Mm -hmm. All right, am I going to use this? Am I going to see this a lot? Um, so if you define your database column, um, if you define it as, say, var binary or binary, you're going to get a buffer back from the database. Um, if the column is defined as var binary binary, it would be. Uh, well, what we're doing here with mm -hmm. our tests or with the labs, we don't have any binary. It's all like var char and right and things right. like that, right? So this is kind of a rare case. Um, it's not a rare case because, as it turns out, uh, bcrypt is the ex is is kind of an exception to this because bcrypt ends up ends up giving you the hash back as a string. Um, although I want to look at how bcrypt is doing it, and maybe you'll notice a few things. Um, with when you do a password hash, you generally don't get back a string. You generally get back a buffer. Generally, if you're hashing something, you're getting if you're hashing something, you're getting back a byte array. Um, or if you encrypt something um, using an encryption algorithm, you're going to get a byte array. Does that follow? Okay. So but if you're using you encryption or hashing, yeah. you're likely to get a buffer. Okay, but Bcrypt doesn't do that. Bcrypt, as it turns out, doesn't do that, which kind of does make things a little bit easier, but I still, you still need to have this kind of um, understanding because you're going to run into it at some point in your career um, because it's kind of a common, common problem. Um, but we're also actually just going to see it. If we take a close look at what Bcrypt is doing as well as JWT, we'll see that both of those are using this trick called Base64 encoding. Um, so we'll, we'll oh, see okay. it kind of in a minute. We're not going to necessarily use a lot of this directly, um, but it actually is happening. Um, so I want to make sure that you understand it. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that's basically the idea. We, we want to take, want to take these buffers, um, and we want to be able to, um, sometimes we need to represent them as strings. Um, but representing them as strings is, is not a direct fix. So what we often do is we use a trick called um, Base64 encoding. Um, and Base64 encoding is a technique to safely encode any binary data as strings. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to mention, if you're working with um, your database, I believe that I saw if you have a boolean column that also comes back as a binary as a buffer by the way different different topic but um, buffers usually are binary bar binary at the database so anyway so base64 it's a technique to safely encode your your binary data as strings um, you often find that you need this um, to kind of anytime you need to embed data within text um, especially binary data with it specifically binary data within text um, so, for instance, maybe I want to embed um, my password hash or some encrypted data inside of a JSON document or inside of XML, or maybe I need to put it in a SQL query so I can insert my profile icon into the database. Um, email actually uses this a lot. It uses this under the covers to send back, um, send back and forth emails anytime you have... Uh, Anytime you have an HTML in your email, which is basically all the time, um, things get um, your 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 email client is actually doing this base64 encoding all the time. 
um, with the data you send back and forth, um, especially if you're dealing with attachments and things like that. Um, so base64 encoding uses a 64 character table and it encodes data in in six bit groups. Um, remember that a byte is eight bits, right? Um, so that's that's basically a, a byte can be from 0 to 256, right? Or sorry, 0 to 255. So there's there's 256 different values for a byte. We're encoding this with with literal characters, so we're kind of limited in what we can use. So we're 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 streaming it down to just 64 characters, uh, but that 64 characters means that we we have to basically encode it with each character being representing six bits instead of eight bits. Um, so what that means, because we're using doing things in six bits instead of eight bit groups. Um, this does take up 33% more space. Anytime you do a base 64 encoding, it will take up 33% more space because of that grouping. Um, so you have to you have to kind of generally we want to store things in binary form whenever possible, especially when we're putting into the database. I'd want to put it ideally in as, as binary or var binary to save space instead of putting it in as as var car. Cool. Um, but this does enable us to save things um, that are binary data in a varchar column, um, even though we, we necessarily probably don't want to do that. Um, but it does give us a way to get it through because um, we still potentially have to put it into SQL. And SQL is, well, it's not a binary language, it's a text language. Um, so you have to get things into text often times um, so here's a here's a table that I pulled off Wikipedia they've got an example of what this base 64 code uh, base 64 table might look like um, it does vary a little bit from implementation to implementation um, but for the most part it's very close um, so the characters that we use are all the letters both uppercase and lowercase uh, we use the numbers and then we always use two special characters um, and the, the two special characters is where different versions of um, Base64 differ. So I've seen like, uh, I think Apache's got a version of, of Base64 encoding. Um, Android's got a version of Base64 encoding. C Sharp has a different version of Base64 encoding. And um, as well as JavaScript has, has a version, but they don't always agree on these two special characters. So sometimes when you're transferring things in Base64 from one place to another, um, just be forewarned that sometimes you have to tweak it a little bit because they don't agree on what those two characters are. Okay? Um, so basically what we do is we take, you can kind of see in the middle, we've got these, these six bit six groups um, so we basically take the letters, the uppercase letters, and call those um, from, from, from 0 um, up to 25, right? So that gives us 25 characters, uh, or 26 characters, and then we go take the lowercase letters, and then that gets us all the way up to uh, 52 characters. Add in the digits, um, that puts us up to to 62 and then we just need two more to fill it in and put it at 64 and the reason we use 64 is because it's a power of two um, so it leads to less issues having it that way I wish that there was a standard for base 64 on those two it's just that yeah different different platforms have have come to a different um, different decision on those two yeah, and um, I don't know why that is. Yeah. Is there any way to uh, kind of like, is there any easier way to memorize this table, like maybe a pattern or anything like that? You don't have to memorize the table. Okay. That's the that's the catch of it. You just have to know that this is, this is here. Um, but you don't have to memorize the table because you will never write the table yourself. Um, basically, there's if you're if you're doing base 64, you should be using a version of, of base 64 that somebody else has written. Um, suffice okay. to say, um, there's enough gotchas that, it, uh, in reality, base 64 is is not hard to write an algorithm for. 
Um, but there's a lot of gotchas, especially if you're not familiar with bit twiddling, because you're going from uh, eight bit groups down to six bit groups. So you have to do some weird things where like, um, even just for the first, the second character, you have to take two bits from the first byte and four bits from the second one. And then you do four bits from the second one and, and two bits from the next. And, and so there's, there's some weird sort of bit masking stuff that you have to know to implement this yourself. Um, using, um, you remember we usually use the double ampersand and the double or. Yeah. Um, because those are logical operators. So if you're going to implement this yourself, you actually have to understand the single ones, the single ampersand and the single or, um, which are bitwise operators. Um, so th there's some, there's some tw tweaks and techniques if you get into the low level messing around with the bits. Um, and that's where you use those single and and single ampers, single or. Um, but that's really beyond the scope of this curriculum here. So, bit twiddling is a, a great and fun thing, um, but it's one of those things that's hard to teach uh, newbie developers. And doesn't always come up that frequently, so it's kind of like, eh, it's important. I, I always run into problems for it, but sometimes there's other, a lot of times there's other ways to do it and things like that. Um, so, anyway. So that's the table. Um, one other thing I might note on here, and you can kind of see at the bottom of the table, we also use the equal sign um, as the padding character. And, and as far as I've seen, every every version of A64 does use equals as a padding. Um, I, th I th don't know if I've run into any that doesn't do that that way. Um, but I have seen like period used as one of these characters, for instance. Uh, which actually we saw in the other day when we were using bcrypt because we saw periods show up. That's because they're using periods in their, their version of base 64. Um, so um, if we're saying that the equals, we've got padding because if I take something, say, you know, I've got a certain number of bytes that doesn't always evenly divide into six bit groups. Um, so because things don't always evenly divide, uh, we may have either no padding at the end, we might have one padding, one padding equals, or we might have two. Uh, so you can kind of look at the end of the, the encoded string and you're going to either see zero, one, or two of those padding characters, depending on how it rounded. Um, so if I take a, maybe a fortune cookie saying, all things are difficult before they are easy, if I run that through the space 64 and algorithm, this is what that's going to look like on the other end, right? So on the other end, it looks like it's noise, right? It almost looks like it's encryption, even though it's, it's not actually encryption because there's no secret here. Um, it's just an encoding. Um, but you can see from here to there, the, the nice thing that how this generates, because it doesn't have all those special characters in there, right? The only special characters that that introduced were plus, slash, and equals. Um, and especially it's nice that it's forward slash and not backslash, right? We don't have to then do any special escaping with this in general. See that? because it's largely letters and numbers. Um, so that means you can easily put this into any place that, that kind of needs to be context that needs to be text. So you can base 64 encode it on one side and then decode it on the other side um, to get back to the original um, byte array. Yeah, I don't see what the table on the previous page has to do with this, but you know, I'll just have to believe the computer does it for me. And yeah, that's well, the, the bump there. Yeah, basically what you're going to see is you're going to see this engine. You, you just say you're going to have a box and you say run it through this box and it's going to spit out data on the other hand. Um, I'm showing the table because that's the that's kind of part of the implementation of that base 64 encoding, but you don't actually have to know that table if that makes sense. Um, the the table is just illustrative of you know here's what the characters are and this is kind of how it works underneath the covers 
right? So you take each each group of six six bits and, and convert it to a character. Um, the way that you do this in Node is actually super simple. You take your buffer and you call two string with the base sixty four. That's it. Um, you you've taken that and now you have a base sixty four encoded string. That's all. Um, so so actually using it in Node is is pretty easy. Other other languages require. Um, maybe require a few more things to set up to use it. Um, but but that's all you have to do for node is two string base 64 if you've got a buffer. Um, so in this case here I've 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 created a buffer. Oftentimes it would come from the database, but here I'm saying make a buffer from the text hello world um, and then base 64 encoding it and logging it. Questions? Um, and I've linked a, a Stack Overflow thread here that's answer that's relevant to this, and he he spells out a few more things regarding. You yeah, know, do you have to import a library, or is that native? That's native. This is built into Node. So to do base sixty four encoding, you don't need a library. Some languages, some technologies, you may need a base. You may need a. You may need to bring in a library, um, but not for Node. So. Um, the thing I want you to just get out of this basically was is if you see something like this, right, then you know that that's a base 64 encoding going on. That's the big thing to recognize is to recognize it when you see it. Um, so if we say, um, let me go into the example we were looking at yesterday, password hashing, and I'm going to kill my server here. Nodemon So if I look at the string that that generates, right? So look at this string here. Does that look like it's been base64 encoded? Maybe a little bit? Yeah. Uh, because they've taken a binary array, binary data and and done that with it. So that's why you're seeing letters, um, letters and numbers with mixed casing. Obviously, as you kind of saw with the table, the casing does matter. Um, so that's one of the things you do have to be careful with base 64 is it's not absolutely case insensitive. So you can't do things like too lower, too upper, upper you'll destroy the data. Um, Mr. Smith. Yep. Um, the salt rounds, okay. I've I've seen this before on Bcrypt. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, um, can someone just just come through and guess your salt rounds or no? It doesn't matter if they guess them. But like, how does that? How does the vulnerability at that point? If everyone can use the same salt rounds, how does that the vulnerability to encode it? You know what I mean? The how fact is that you're salting it all. Um, so the the thing is, when you're salting, you're introducing a random string. That's what a salt is. Um, yeah. And with that, you're introducing, if you're doing 10 salt rounds, you're introducing 10 random strings. So even if you're always doing 10 rounds of that, you still have 10 random strings every time. Which means that it's not, there's no reason to keep that number secret. Does that follow? Yeah. I, I was just curious because, like, yeah, encrypt is full open source. So I was uh -huh. just curious on how, like, someone yeah. hasn't figured out how to get there someone's like kind of you know what i mean yeah the the fact that the fact that if if you say you're using 10 and you make that public knowledge that doesn't make your system any let any more vulnerable as it turns out um that being a secret isn't isn't valuable and and that's evidenced by the fact that the salt rounds is literally here um, because you do need to know how many rounds of salting were done to check it, um, to check the, the, the password they've given you against the, the password that was hashed. Um, but they don't put any sort of, you're not hiding that value. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not a value you need to hide. Um, 
But anyway, getting back to the base64 question, so you can see that there's slashes in there. Um, and if I were to run this again, um, you'd see that, okay, well, they're using periods and slashes. So those are the two special characters that they picked out, is slashes and periods, is the ones that Bcrypt is using for their base64. Follow? So they're not using slash and plus, they're using slash and dot. All right, so let's go into, we've kind of talked about base64. Let's move on to talking about JSON web tokens. Um, so as I kind of prefaced last yesterday, um, JSON web tokens are going to be this key for making our authentication system work um, and making it so that you don't have to enter your username and password every page. Um, so we kind of we're going to use these tokens to generate. Uh, we're going to use this to generate what we call a token, which is just basically comes out as a string. Um, but that string is what we're going to use to prove our in identity. Um, and it's got some security mechanisms around it. So that you, even if you can change your cookies, um, you can't necessarily give yourself a different token. Um, so um, in general, um, JSON, provi JSON Web Tokens provides a secure mechanism to issue what we would call authentication tokens, ways to prove who you are, prove your identity, um, that can be used, well, yeah, to prove your identity. Um, so for instance, here's an example token that's been encoded. Um, and you'll see it kind of color-coded because there's three different parts to any sort of, um, any sort of JWT token. So for instance, we have first in red, this is that first part going up to the period. Um, that's what we refer to as the header. Um, the second part is the payload, which is where our actual data is. So we've got some metadata that's been encoded here. We've got the payload in here. And then the last part in blue um, is the signature, what we call the signature. And that's based on all the data that comes before. Um, so if you change any of this data here in the header or the payload, that also affects the signature. Um, and basically, because, um, because your users can't figure out what the new signature is, um, that's what allows you to then um, not, they can't change the data in the payload. Okay. So you see those three sections. Now, looking at the that example here, do you notice something? Like we were just talking about base64, right? Well, I, I see that at least the first three characters are the same for the header and for the payload. Uh, I think that just happened by random circumstance. Actually, I think I know why that is. Um, I take that back. It doesn't, it's not really relevant, but you'll notice that they kind of look like base 64. Yeah. Right. So, so JWT is doing some base 64 encoding. It's, but it's base 64 encoding each of these three parts. So the headers being base 64 encoded, the paste payloads being base 64 encoded, as well as the signature. All three of those are, are base 64 encoded. Um, so let's look like, look at what that looks like in its decoded form. Okay, so in its decoded form, here is what the header is. So the header says algorithm is HS256. Um, so that specifies what the algorithm is for computing the signature. Um, and it says it's a, a JWT token. So that's what's in the header information. Um, and pretty much we don't touch the header information. That's just generated and, and, and um, generated anytime we put a token in there. Um, so usually you don't really have to concern yourself with the header information. What we care most about though is the, the payload section, which is where we're gonna put our actual data. So for instance in here, 
I've got a few properties. You can kind of see I've got a JSON object in there as my payload. Um, so I've got sub is one property, it's got a number. Name has another value. And I've got this IA at. Um, this, is, this is the time it was issued. So I at stand, is short for issued at. Okay. So that's the, the payload data that's actually in the token and we can, we can pull out of the token. What's up, Mo? Um, I had a question. So I don't know if you're familiar with the mo node module uh, passport. Mm -hmm. Um, so with web tokens, were ba to use them for like logins and everything. I know that I've run into passport before, but I haven't directly used it myself. So oh, I can't do you really recommend us using it. it because it's okay? Huh? Do you recommend us building our own uh, login? We're not going to learn about passport. I'm expecting you to build your own stuff this semester. Yeah. Okay, I was just so. curious. Um, so um, there is there's kind of the the payload information that's the part that we care the most about um, and then the signature um, and this algorithm changes but the basic all you need to know is that it's a hash what goes in the signature is a hash of a combination of the header the payload and the secret um, so the, the header stuff is here, we can see that, the payload we can see here, but the secret is basically a, a secret password um, that get, gets used to, to build this hash. Um, so as long as your users don't have that secret, they don't have that password, um, then they can't, um, they can't figure out what the signature would be if they were to change the data. Um, so that's where, like, if I just had a cookie with this information in here, right, and maybe I said, oh, well, I want to change my name to um, Jane Doe, and I want to change my user ID to 12, um, I could do that directly with the cookie, but I can't do that with this because I don't know what that secret is to regenerate that hash, to regenerate that signature. Does that follow? Yeah. yeah. So if I make a tiny change, if I make a change to this payload, it doesn't, I have to figure out what the new hash is and, and because I can't do that, I can't. My token will be invalid if I make a change without getting the wrong, getting the right hash. Um, so that's what really provides us that security um, to make sure that you can't steal somebody else's account somebody else's account now that being said if you know the secret if you get the secret then you can you can still impersonate so you have to make sure that 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 secret is is kept private but you also want to make sure that it's it's sufficiently random um, so that somebody can't just guess it so it's it's definitely something for that secret whatever you use in production should be something that's come out of a random number generator um, it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be anything plain text that you've come up with. Um, it shouldn't be a password that you can read or remember. It should be something that you could it be so long and be so random that you could never remember it. Um, so that secret could easily be 200 plus characters long. That would be a good secret. Okay. So there's a few different NPM packages available um, that will let you generate and validate these JWT tokens. Um, the one we're going to be using this semester is called JSON Web Token. Um, that's the package we'll be using. You can install it with NPM install JSON Web Token and, and obviously look at it on the docs. Um, if you go to the JWT.io page, um, you can learn about all the different um, libraries that are available for working with JWT tokens. Um, in fact, JWT tokens are used much more broadly um, than just in, um, just in Node now. There's actually a library for most technologies. Um, so for instance, you can see that there's even, there's three different options available for .NET right there and another, another several. Um, that's pulling from what, NuGet is the way they do their packages over in the C-sharp world, the .NET world. So there's six different packages there. 
There's four different versions of this for Python. Um, there's two versions of this for Node. So JSON Web Token is the one we're going to use. Um, there's another one called Jose, um, which also basically does the same similar things. Um, you've got some packages for Java. You've got some pack other packages for for JavaScript that you could use as well. Um, so there's a bunch of different, you know, understanding JWT is kind of a critical thing for modern authentication because it doesn't just, it's not just specific to um, Node. Cool. Um, also on this page, if you look into it, um, they've got kind of an example that you can play around with, so you can switch the algorithms up, um, and you can play with the payload. So, like, I could say, well, let's put in um, user ID, and let's try five, and maybe username, test. Um, so you can play around with the data here, and it'll dynamically show you what the token is that goes with that. Um, so that can be very helpful for testing, especially if you're doing things with, um, for instance, if you're doing things with Postman, that way you can generate tokens and, and have that available so you can kind of put that in into your data. Um, it also gives you the, the, this also is set up in a way where you can take a token that you have, you can put it in here and it'll actually decode it. Um, so you can actually inspect and look at um, the token for almost for if you have a token you can look at it here um, you can even look at let's say i go to an, a website that's using this i can take their token out of the cookie and go look at the data that they're putting in there um, so this is a way to inspect um, not just the the tokens that you create but you actually can expect um, tokens that other websites have created this way Um, so using the, the JSON web token package is, is, again, kind of about as simple as, as working with the bcrypt package. Um, there's really only two methods you have to know about. Um, one is sign and one is verify. Um, so sign will give you a um, JSON web token. The simplest version of that is you just give it a payload object and you give it a secret. So here we're giving it the, the payload with the property foo value bar, we're putting that in as the payload, and we've got a secret of shh, um, so we're putting that in there, um, and that will then give us a token. Cool? Um, so that's the, the simplest version. You just need a payload, whatever you want to put in there, it'd be the contents of the data and a secret that's used to keep it secure. Um, this, however, if you use this method, your um, tokens will be good for forever. They will never expire. Um, your token will, will be will never go away. Will never become invalid. So what that means is, if you do it this way, the user is never going to be logged out. Um, they could take this token and log back into your system. Use this token again in a year, and it would still be valid, um, or ten years, or whatever the case may be. And that's a that's a good thing. It's usually not a good thing. Right, so so this is the way you issue tokens if you want them to be permanent, um, but generally you don't want them to be permanent. So you should add an additional parameter, which is the options. Um, and in the option, you can expect you can say how long it how long it's good for. So here I'm saying that the that expires in an hour. Okay, is that what's what do you do? What do you think is reasonable? It really depends on what you're building. Um, so if I was building this for, say, a bank, an hour is probably a long time. Um, I probably wouldn't want a cookie, uh, sorry, a token out there that's good for an hour if I was building a banking website. Um, but so, you know, I might say less, even less than an hour potentially on a banking website um, versus if I'm building like a social media network, you're basically going to be on there for a long time. I might set that token to be good for a year. Um, 
So it really depends on what you're building. Um, if I'm building e-commerce, you know, I might set it to a week or two weeks. It really depends on in how much um, how much security risk are you kind of willing to tolerate versus the um, how often do you need your users to log back in, right? So a social media network, most of the time you don't expect your users to log in a lot of times. Again, because you want them to be able to get notifications and things like that when they're not on your site. Cool. So is this kind of like a replacement for a cookie or just like a more secure cookie? It's not a replacement for a cookie. Um, it is a more secure cookie. So what you what you do is you take this token and you put it into your cookie. Rather than storing the data directly, you put it into this package, right? So the payload is basically the, the data that you would have otherwise stored in the cookie in an insecure format by putting it the data not directly into the cookie, but it putting into a token and then putting the token in the in the cookie. That's what gives you the security. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll take that, we'll take that token and put it into the cookie instead. So once you, so that's what you would do, say on the login screen, you would issue a cookie and you'd have it expire in whatever time makes sense. Um, and then once the user is going to further pages, say your, your dashboard or any other screen that, that they need a login for, um, that's where you would then verify the token. You would make sure it's correct. Um, so the way to, to do the verification, you just, just like we were doing previously, it was, um, jwt.sign, this is jwt.verify. So we call the verify method, but not with the payload and the secret, we call it with the token and the secret. Um, so we say, here's the token, here's our secret, go decrypt it, check it, make sure it's good. Um, and so, okay, here's the, the payload comes out and we say, okay, well, we can, we can log the payload. Um, so we can we can check that the the token's good, and then pull the data out if it's good and use it. Um, you always want to wrap this in a try catch, um, because if the token is invalid, um, either doesn't exist or it's invalid, this is going to generate an exception. Okay. So can the secret be anything? The secret can be any string. Okay. Um, for development, it doesn't need to be secure. Um, you, you can use a short like my password or my secret, whatever it is. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is for um, the development side. Um, although this is one of those things that I would put into your configuration um, as a configuration variable because it's something you want to be able to change between different environments and with environment variables. Um, so I might use a, a, a very insecure secret for testing, but I would use a much more secure test, secure um, secret for production. So it's pretty much like an unlock password or a lock password. What do you mean a lock password? Uh, so like to lock the token in this sense, I guess. Yeah, uh, because if you have the secret, then the token is not secure. Okay. Because uh, what what makes the token as secure is that you have to guess what the secret is before you can modify the data. You have to know what the, the secret is. Um, so as long as that secret is, is close to impossible to guess, um, then you're good. So things like, you know, from from the standpoint of, you know, maybe your user and and certain things maybe you don't care if that that tokens breached within you know um your your windows for a single user are it doesn't necessarily need to be as secure um, but when you're talking about that secret that's a secret that you want to be secure enough that you think that um, someone wouldn't breach it within like However, where your frequency of changing that is. So if you only change that token, if you only change that secret once a year, well then it should take 10 years for somebody to crack it, right? Um, you don't wanna say, well, we're, we're, or 
you know, you still probably want to change the secret every once in a while um, because it's like, well, you're probably not going to come up with a secret that may last 20 years. Um, but yeah, anyway. So the secret is really what, what makes it secure um, with the hashing and stuff built onto it. Um, so generally speaking, as I kind of, I said this already, um, we're generally going to send back this JWT token as a, as, as a cookie so that we can then use it on later requests as your way of proving your identity. So then any later request, we can look at that token and say, okay, they have a token. It's a good token. So I know what user they are. And I have some information in there. Yeah, you know, you saw the payload as an object. Well, so because it's an object, I can stuff multiple bits of data into that token, right? So common things I might do, I might put things into that token like, um, you know, I might put their user ID. I can also put their username. I can put their email address. Um, I can put in there, you know, if I have their first and last name, I can put that in there as well. Um, if I have uh, like admins, different roles, I can put in to mark this user as an admin or not into that cookie, uh, into that token. Um, so I can put all sorts of data that I may need to refer back to later. Um, but the nice thing is I can refer back to the, the data in the token, the data in the payload without going to the database. So you can also use this as a way to not have to look up user information every time the user wants to go to another page. Cool. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of websites where, for instance, it, up at the top, they show your username, right? Yeah. Um, and oftentimes your profile icon too. Um, but if you have, so if you have the, the username and the user ID, you can easily implement that 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 profile icon and profile name in the navbar without a database call, uh, which is kind of some of what we had to do with with older mechanisms. Is you had to go to the data. You if you just store the user ID um, because that's kind of you didn't really have an object to store. Um, then you you still have to go to the database every time they visit a page to get their their username. But JWT lets you put a little bit more information there. Um, you can find out a whole lot more about JWT on the official website at jwt.io. Um, there's, there's a ton of reading material that you can find there about how this works and how to play around with it. Um, but the, the gist of it is, you know, there's two methods with JSON web token. One sign generates a token, verify checks the token's good. That's basically it. So, so given all those pieces, right? So we've talked about um, we've talked about cookies. We've talked about um, using middleware. We've talked about uh, JSON web tokens. Um, what I'd like to do is take some of those pieces together and and show you how you can now write a middleware function um, that will validate or or authenticate the user um, using that that token. So we can take what we've learned, we can implement that as a middleware function, we can then use that, uh, we, we can make that middleware function require you to be logged in anytime you, you visit a page or a REST endpoint. Um, we can implement it for both of those things. And then this, this really allows you to do, um, quickly add some authentication to your pages um, without having to do a lot of code duplication. Of like, let's put, you know, let's say you have that that verify the JSON JWT verify thing. Maybe you don't want to put that every in every place where you need to be logged in, right? I'd like to just add a middleware into those places. Cool. Um, so there's a few different ways to to implement this middleware functionality. Um, so this is this is one way that you can do it. 
Um, this is by no means like the only way and is it necessarily, it's not necessarily always the right way either. Um, but this is kind of an example that, you know, I threw together of, of how you might put these pieces together. Um, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt, adapt it to your own purposes. Um, but here's kind of an, an example. Um, so this is in my, I'm going to call, I'm going to put this file into a folder named middleware and I'm going to call this auth.js. Um, so I'm bringing in some dependencies. I've got my config package because that's where I'm putting my secret. Um, I've got JWT, I've got debug for doing some logging. Um, and then I define my middleware function. So you can see module.exports, I'm exporting it immediately because I'll never need to use the module, the, the function directly in this module. Um, I only use the middleware in other modules. Um, so I'm just going ahead and exporting it. Um, so we've got a request, response, and next. Um, remember, anytime you're writing a middleware, you typically need to have next in there to tell it to go run the next middleware. Okay. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to get the token. Um, so the token I can get from cookies. So I'm going to say request.cookies. And, and here, you know, this, this is where things may differ for you. I've called that cookie auth underscore token. Um, if you called it something like my token, then it would be my token over there. Um, but that's the name I've used, is the name of my cookies auth token. So I'm saying request.cookies.auth token. So that will give me the value of the token that was set previously um, on the login screen potentially. Okay, so we've got the token. Um, I'm gonna throw an error if there isn't a token. So we just skip the rest of the code and go, if there's no token, if they don't have that cookie, then we go ahead and just go to the, the catch case, log it and send it back to the login page. Okay, so you can see in the catch, if anything goes wrong, I'm redirecting them to account slash login. See that? Yeah. Depending on your particular application, um, you might want that to just call the next. Um, so you can let the next middleware deal with it, deal with what to do with it. Um, and, but sometimes you want to redirect to account login. Sometimes with your REST APIs, it's better to send it back as an error message, but give them the, I think there's a 401 status code that you can say um, 401 status code is like, hey, you're you're not logged in and you need to be logged in to do this. So what you specifically do in the error case, that's probably where you're gonna see the most difference uh, because there's at least three different ways to do that. Um, so I here I've just taken the simple answer of like, well, let's just say we'll redirect you back to the login screen. Um, that's kind of the, the basic solution, but that may not always work for you. Um, so we grab the token. If there's no token, we throw an error. Next thing I need to grab the secret, and you can see I'm grabbing the secret from uh, config.get, so from the configuration files, and I've got it in a play in a key called auth.secret. So it's in a category. Remember we created those categories like database and HTTP, etc. Um, I created another category called auth, so I can put authentication things in there, and then the key inside of that is named secret. Okay, so that's where I'm getting the value from the configuration. Okay, so we've got a token, we've got a secret. Now we can actually try to check the token. So I'm gonna say jwt.verify, give it the token and the secret, and if everything goes right, we'll get back the payload, and then that payload we can run off to the races with. If anything goes wrong with the token where it's not a valid token or it's expired, um, then it's going to go down to this this catch because it's going to throw an exception if the token is expired. Cool? Um, or otherwise invalid. Um, so if if it if it is a valid token, we'll get the payload back here as 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 a object. Um, I'm going to log it quick so you can see it in the console, and then I'm going to use another trick here. So remember the request object. And I kind of mentioned this when I was talking about middlewares last week. You can actually add additional properties to your request and response objects in your middleware. So for instance here, I'm saying now that we have this, I'm adding it to my request as request.user. 
So now every everything after this can just go request.user. It doesn't have to verify the token. It can say, is request.user there? If request.user is there, then you're logged in. If it's not there, then you're not logged in. Cool. Um, I could have called that anything. So I could have said this is request.auth or um, otherwise. Um, but but it gives me a way to store that that data as part of the request so it can be used further in the chain. Um, and then I'm saying next, which then will allow whatever's next to, to execute. So now it can use whatever data I pulled out of that token. Cool. Can you see how maybe this this helps reduce the amount of code that you have to write potentially? You start to see it? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. show how to like tie this into the chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's actually really easy. Um, so you import it. So in this case, I'm in my my routes. So I have to go up a step, and then I go down to middleware auth. Um, and so I've got my auth middleware. And I just put it in here. So here I've got account me as the is basically my profile page. Um, and in order to get to your profile page, you have to be logged in. So I just insert it here. Why didn't you tell me I could do this earlier? <laughs> so, so you just insert it there, and now you don't have to duplicate any of the the verification your 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 checking code. Um, so that that means that you can very easily say, okay, well this route. I just add this one little thing, and now this route you can't get to without being logged in. So that's like, remember with the test, you've got the, the dashboard, right? That you shouldn't be able to get to if you're not logged in. Yeah. I just add this middleware. Done. You can't get there with without being logged in. Mr. Smith, is this going to be on perusal? Huh? Is this going to be on perusal? Yeah, I'll take the slides and put them on perusal. Um, okay. I've also got the code example to go with this, and we'll look at this in a minute. Um, I've got a full code example of of, of this um, on Git as well. That's one of the main reasons why my code is messy in the labs and everything. <laughs> well, we hadn't talked about middleware yet, so. Um, yeah, it's an easier way. I just didn't know. And... Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You, you kind of iterate over time, right? So um, that we can do, and, and you can see I can now refer to that request.user or request.auth if, if I called it request.auth in there. Now I can get that user data and pass it on to my view. So, so now my view can use, use that data that's, that's there. Cool. Um, so I can render my, my nav bar differently or all those kind of things using the, the data that's in there questions so far nope. okay um, so that's the last slide in my deck um, we're sitting at 137 um, I've got a code example to accompany this um, to kind of look at this in a, in a, in a more fully worked application um, so I want to go over that but let's take a quick break so so here's what I'm Here's what I've got built and, and working. It's kind of a stripped down example to some sense, but but also trying to be complete to have kind of all the parts, parts there so you can see um, where some of these pieces fit in into the applications that you've already built. Um, so here I've got, I've got my homepage, I've got a login screen, um, it's got a username and password. Um, I've already kind of pre-filled that in there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and hit login, and it takes me to my profile page. So here I'm at, you saw when my login screen was at account login, my profile screen is at profile me. So if I enter the correct credentials, it goes ahead and redirects me there. Um, if I don't enter the correct password, it's going to say credentials invalid. Um, so I can go to a profile screen, and then I can also hit log out. Once I hit log out, it takes me back to the uh, login screen and you see if I try to go to my profile now, it just automatically redirects me back to the login screen instead. Okay? Um, and so you can see on the, once I get to the profile screen, it's showing me some, some user information. Okay.
Okay, so that's that's what we're building here. That's what we're going to look at. Questions? Um, I think that should be enough to kind of see where where the parts fit in. Um, so let's go to it. Um, so we're going to look at the maybe look at the database first. Um, so I've defined um, a database for this application. Um, and the name of the database is example auth. So there's a there's a schema script here in the data folder for it. Um, if you're looking for this code example, um, the place that you'll find it, um, it's in that same repo that you pulled down previously of my code examples. Um, the place you're going to find this code example is under unit three examples auth examples. So if you can pull that up, um, that's where you're going to find all this code. So unit three examples, auth examples. Um, so if you want to look at that for yourself, um, you'll find it there. Okay. Um, so the database, it just has one table, call it users. Um, and that users table has four columns. It's got an ID column, a username column, an email column, and a, a password hash column. Everybody see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and typically, because this is going to be the hashed password, I'm going to call that password hash or hashed password. I don't want to just call that password um, to avoid confusion um, because it's not the actual password. It's the hash of the password. Uh, so I, I typically use a different name there. Okay. Um, I've also marked the username, the ID as the primary key, username, and, and email. I'm requiring those to be unique. And then I've got some data that I'm inserting in there, for instance. Um, so this data, I generated most of it through Mockaroo, um, although I changed the first row to be something else. So here I've got a username of admin, and I've got admin at example.com as my email. Um, and I've got this hash, right? So that's the hash of my password, right? Now, if I'm looking at this data, can I figure out what the original password was? No. No. If I had your database, if I stole your database and I ran off with it, could I take this database and figure out what that password was? Nope. Not easily, no. I'd have to do a bunch of guessing and I'd say, well, is this your password? Is this your password? Is this your password? Is this your password? And maybe eventually I might figure it out. As it stands, this is actually a really simple password because it's password. Uh, <laughs> it's just been hashed, right? So I can't easily just copy the password and put it into the password field, right? Um, that's one of the strengths of doing it this way is we don't actually have the original password. And as, as you saw, I can still log in. Even though I don't have the original password, I can still log in with the correct password. Um, uh, because it's hashed, right, that means there's only one way of doing it. Uh, you'll explain that later, right? The, 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 this hash mm -hmm. that we're seeing here on the screen, that is uh, one way only, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that hash would be, the, the place you would generate that would be on the register screen. This example doesn't have a register screen, but that's where you would put the code to generate the, the hash. Does a longer password equate to a harder hash to crack, or are they all pretty much the same? Um, so yes, it still does. Um, a longer password is still better, um, because you remember that the basically to crack the hash, you can't reverse it. Um, so because you can't reverse it, you still have to guess what the password might be. Right, so the longer your password is, the wider that search space is. Right, so if I'm going to say my 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 password is only four characters long, right? How many different four character passwords are there? Not that many. Yes. Right? So I can guess all of the four character passwords in in virtually no time. In fact, everything up to eight eight characters, uh, eight characters or less, can be guessed. Um, easily within uh, 
easy within 24 hour period with just moderate with with decent hardware um, so that's part of why that it still needs to be longer than eight is because those that eight or less is just too easy to guess all the possible combinations got it um, so the you it's still a way of you have to guess all the things so if you have say a 30 character password well then you have a lot more combinations potentially to guess to get to the right thing there's a lot more things that it could be um, so a longer password is there um, and I think I at some point I pointed to the you know the XKCD comment comic about making a good password yeah horse battery staple um, you know that's still the best technique to, to come up with a secure password and doing it that way is still good when you're hashing this. Um, it just as it turns out if you don't hash it it doesn't matter how secure your password is because it's actually going to be breached. Um, because if I have my passwords literally here right it's somebody steals the entire database right they take a backup of the database steal it and now they have all your passwords right. Um, but this, if I steal this, I don't necessarily directly have all your passwords. I have to crunch, 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 crunch. Um, okay. So that's what the database looks like. Um, with Mockeroo, by the way, um, as far as I could tell, um, they don't have a way to generate a, a hashed password. Uh, Makaru can generate passwords, but as far as I can tell, it can't generate hashed passwords for you. Um, so you'll still have to do that manually. You'll still have to manually go through and, and hash the passwords um, to put data in there. So, you know, you might... Upside, though, is you really don't need that many users for most things to test it. So you can kind of do um, the few accounts that you need. So maybe you, you do three accounts manually. Um, and then put the put the hashes in there, which is what I did. I generated the hash and then put it into here. Um, so that's that's how I would go about that. Um, I forget where I was going. Okay, so that's the database side. Um, usually, so I've set this I've set this type as varcar64 because it turns out um, I think there always end up being. Um, 60 characters long was kind of what I what I saw, um, but I'm just adding a few extra characters for padding, um, and I also made this var car um, so it's a variable length again to give some more um, flexibility and, and things like that. Um, because in theory it's always 60, I could have said this is car car 60, um, to, and that would have been more potentially more efficient. Um, but it wouldn't be as as flexible, right? I might have to change it if I change how I do my password hashing. Make sense? Yep. Um, so I'm still using a var car there, even though I could be using a car. Um, and that's just, yeah, that's just to make it so I don't have to change things later if I change things around. All right, um, so let's go look at the server. Um, and maybe before that, my dependencies. So the dependencies that I've brought in here, um, I've brought in bcrypt. We talked about that. Config. Uh, cookie parser is one I forgot to mention yesterday. It turns out to actually work with the, and read the cookies, you do need to uh, install the cookie parser dependency. Um, and I'll show how to use that middleware. Um, but that's one thing you do have to set up in order to be able to read the cookies. Um, as it turns out, you don't need the cookie parser if you're just going to write them, but you do need the cookie parser to read them. Uh, so next up is debug, .env, express, express handlebars. There's my JSON web token, connects Morgan and MySQL. So we basically talked about most of those dependencies already with the exception of, of cookie parser. Um, so that's what I have in there. Um, so looking at the server side, um, all you have to do to really use cookie parser, you bring it in, cookie parser is equal to require cookie parser, and then you say op.use and put the cookie parser middleware in there. That's all you have to do to install the, the cookie parser. 
Um, and I'm installing this at the application level so that any route in the entire system can, can look at those cookies and any middleware. Cool? Otherwise, I'd have to pick and choose and say, well, this gets to read the cookies and that doesn't. Um, questions? Any? Wait, so that allows like all files to use cookie parser? Yeah, so everything can now look at the cookies, every route. Okay, I need to do that. <laughs> yeah, because um, otherwise you won't be able to read the cookies everywhere. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, you remember I said you can install the, the middlewares at three levels? You can install them at the application level, you can install them at the router level, or you can install them at the route level. Um, so in this case, I'm installing the cookie parser at the application level because that's what makes the most sense. Does that work for the body parser? Um, what do you mean? It like when you use uh, express that URL encoded? Um, it doesn't replace that. It's an addition to that. Oh, no, I know. But like um, if you have that yeah. as a server or application level. Yeah, you could put that one application level. I've chosen not to put that one application level. Instead, I put that one down at a router level. So okay. that one I've chosen to put here in my routes. Um, so my route, just this router I'm installing in it too. Not everything. Um, again, you can install it at an application level. I'm just pulling it out there because I don't really need it necessarily on every page. So the cookies I want to be able to have out on every page, but I don't necessarily need form submissions on every page. Um, okay, so so that's defining the middleware at uh, an application level. I'm defining this one at a router level, and and actually on that notice, you know the the middleware that we talked about, that's where I'm going to find that one, then at the you know, the route level. So you were asking, I think last week about like, well, okay, so you've got these three different levels, where would you define different things? So it's like, well, you know, it really depends on what it is um, and, and where you want to define it. So in this case, I'm actually using all three of those levels. Cool. That's partially intentional. Well, okay, so, uh, so Mr. Smith, this has uh -huh. nothing to do APIs. This will just get us in the door and then we'll have access to those endpoints after, right? Um, so you can use this same kind of trick, right? Middle, your, your API routes are routes, right? They're still routes. Um, they just basically return JSON instead of HTML. So you can put the same middleware on those routes. So you can say, well, you can't edit a product unless you're logged in. Right, so I can I can put a middleware like this on the API routes as well. Does that follow? Uh, you, all we have to do is just add that in. Yeah, That's basically, basically. So just now your, right your middleware it. is going to probably look different. You probably don't want to redirect them to the login page for that because that would end up with HTML coming back. Um, so usually what I what I do is I would return something different here in the catch case. Does that follow? Yeah, yeah, I saw Abidella did the air handling before. Yeah. So you might do the air handling a little bit different for your API, but other than that, it's basically going to be the same. All of this stuff in the try wouldn't change for using it with an API. So on the server side, we've hooked up the cookie parser. That's that's an important thing to remember so you can actually work with cookies. Uh, going down here, um, you'll also see that I've ex we kind of talked about middleware. So I, I'm, what I've done is extracted the, the 404 and the 500 error pages that we talked about, and I've extracted them to this middleware folder so I can start building up and having more middlewares. Um, so that's, that's there. Um, so that's the 400, 404s moved over here, 500s move over there. Um, but the big thing then with the cookie parser is I'm bringing in this routes account. Um, so the these three pages, the, the login, the three links in the navbar, the login, the profile, and the logout, 
um, they're all part of this account um, module. Cool. Um, so the routes for those are account slash login, account slash logged out, and account slash me is how I get to my prof profile. Okay. So looking at how the, the login in, is implemented, I've got two methods. Um, the first one being the, you know, just the get, so I can get an empty form. That one's simple, that one doesn't change, because um, all the logic that I need to do isn't until I get into actually posting or submitting the form, okay? So when I get into posting the form, I want to then pull out the username and the password that the user entered, right? We've seen this before. I'm pulling those from request.body. Um, I'm doing a quick log to log the username and password that user entered so I can see that. Um, so for instance, you can see in the log what I put in as the username and password, right? Yeah. Sounds like yeah. it. Um, so I grab the username and password from the fields, um, and then I can go through and do some, some logic and checking that those things are accurate. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to check if the user's actually given me a username. I'm going to say if, they're, if they haven't given me a username, we're, we're done, right? So I'm going to give them the error username is required. Um, if they have given me a password, same thing, we're done. Um, I, we're just gonna go ahead and say password is required. So I don't get down into the actual logic until um, the I know the user's given me both the username and password. Okay, so once I know that, I can then go to the database and go to the database and ask for the user by user name. Now, it, one thing you wanna do for sure when you're querying the database, for the user, you want to go off the username, never send the password as part of that where clause. Um, and in fact, now that we've hashed the password, I can't, right? So I can't say where the password is equal to blah, right? Because I have to do the hashing in JavaScript. I can't do the hashing in SQL. Does that follow? Yeah. So um, I have to only put the username there in the where clause. There is no way to put the password there because it's hashed now, uh, and you really shouldn't. You never, you know, you don't, you didn't really need it anyway because what uniquely defines the user is the username anyway. Um, so we get the user by putting in the username, and um, if that comes back, there is a user with that username, then we'll have an object, or I won't. Um, the next thing I'm doing here, I'm also actually running another query. So I'm saying if this didn't return a user then go try to, if there's no user return from that, let's go try to get the user by email. So by doing this, I actually allow the login screen. You can either put the email or the username in the login field. Do you see that? Yeah, so that way they can use both. Yeah, that way they can use either. And that's all you have to do really to implement that. You just say, go try one, go see if the that matches a username. And if it doesn't match a username, well, let's go try and see if it matches a, a email. Um, so I just run two queries to do that check. Okay. Um, so if that comes back with user, then then I'm good. I'm going to use that user going forward. Um, but if I if I still don't have a user that doesn't match either of those, well, obviously their username or email, whatever they entered, is wrong. Um, so my next check is then to say, is there a user or not, and to check the password. So if there's not a user returned, well, then I immediately know that their credentials are invalid. Um, but I also need to check their password. So I say if there's not a user or they've entered the wrong password, we're going to say credentials are invalid. Otherwise, there's no error. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Wait, how are you comparing the password? So here I'm comparing the password. So this is kind of what we talked about yesterday. I'm using bcrypt. Right, so I say bcrypt.compare, and I pass in first the password, the order of this is important. I'm passing in the password that user entered, which is plain text, 
And the second argument is the hashed password from the database. Oh, so it hashes that first one and sees if it matches. Okay. Exactly. So it hashes the password that the user entered and sees if the hashed password is equal to the password that we hashed previously. Right. So nowhere in there am I unhashing the password. I'm just both of the passwords have now been hashed. And if, if they were the same, then they would have come up with the same hash. Cool? Yep. Okay. Um, so that, that tells me, you know, and then I say not, because I say if it's, if it's not, if they're not the same, then it's invalid. So if either there's not a user or they're not the same, then we go here. Um, and otherwise, that would mean that both the username and the and the password are good. Um, so we can say, okay, there's nothing. Okay, so that's my my logic for testing the username and the password. And you'll notice that I've gotten the kind of the user object declared at a, a wider scope here, um, so that I can access it later. Um, this is not the only way to implement that. This is, but this is the the route that I've taken. So there's all that logic, and then finally I decide what to do with that. So if there's any errors, if they're if if I if their credentials are wrong, um, then I'm going to go ahead and just re-render the username, uh, the the login form like we've saw on, seen previously. Um, I'm going to put the username back in there. I could pass in the password to here. I'm here. I'm not passing the password back, so the password field will end up blank. Um, and I'm passing whatever the error message is. So if they put in the wrong credentials, it's going to say credentials invalid. Cool. Um, also, then if they if there's no error, then I build up the payload. And remember the payload, you want to kind of pick and choose what data you save. So here I'm picking off the ID of the user, the username, and the email. And I'm putting those in those three pieces into the payload. Okay, this is what's going to give me my JWT token. So that's the data that I'm deciding to save. Um, that data will be different depending on what your application is, right? So if your profile screen you show the user's first name and last name, you probably want to put um, the first name and last name in here as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or if you're showing their full name, well, maybe you want to put the, go ahead and put their full name in here. Um, so this is any data that you want to be able to refer back to later. Um, do remember that it's in a cookie, so you don't want that cookie to get too big. So there's kind of a, a trade-off between how much data you put in here and how much you don't, um, because additional data will potentially slow it down. Um, but that being said, this is, these three fields is definitely absolutely not enough to slow it down. Um, it'll end up speeding it up because it means I don't have to hit the database um, in the grand scheme of things. So, yeah. Mr. Smith, uh, something when you highlight over that, it's let user any. What does any mean in that context? I, I don't get that. Uh, where? Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's saying that it can be any data type. It's saying that user, as far as as far as VS Code is concerned, user could be anything. Uh, you mean, well, it's an object, right? I mean, we're, we're getting a property of an object. True, case, right? it's an object. We know that, but VS Code doesn't know that. VS Code uh, doesn't know that it, as far as VS Code's concerned, user could be a string. Okay, so or it's could be a number. instance. Huh? Yeah. So it's saying what what type is it recognizing it as, um, but it doesn't know. And the reason it doesn't know is it's becoming from it's coming from this method, uh, get user by name or get user by email, but that hasn't really told it what type it should be. Um, even error, if I hover over error, it doesn't know the type of error. Error is obviously a string in my code and no, never anything other than a string, but VS Code doesn't know that. Uh, wouldn't it know from just pulling a VS Code has access to your your uh, functions there, get user by username, so it should know it's an object. Anyway, it, it, it's, it's all yeah. right. It, the point is it doesn't know. It, it, and it even doesn't, it's more suspicious notice that it doesn't even know that the error should be a string. 
uh, which as it turns out, it's actually an object sometimes because null is technically an object um, as far as its data type is concerned. Um, and then it's a string down here. So that's kind of where it's, it's, it's technically either an object or um, it's an object or it's a string. So that's part of why it's, it's saying null. Although down here actually it looks like it's figured out that it's a string finally. Okay. So um, I pick off those those values. I say let's let's save the user ID, the username, the email. I'm going to put that in the payload. Um, so I'll be able to refer to those things, those pieces of data later. I'm grabbing the secret, as you can see from the um, the configuration. Um, so if I look at how I've set up my configuration, if I go to default, you'll see I have this section here. I lost it. Um, so in the default config, I've got a section called auth with two values. So salt rounds and secret, so I can configure those two things. Cool? Yep. Um, and then I also, in custom environment variables, I've given those some environment variable names. So I can override that as auth salt sounds, salt rounds, and auth secret. So if I go put this on Heroku, I can I can add a key, I can add a configuration that says auth secret is this really long string, right? Um, for development, I'm just calling it my secret, right? But I don't want to use that value in production, so I've got a way to override that with an environment variable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are we ever going to get into development and production uh, files? What do you mean, development and production? In our config? I, you, I would leave this alone, actually. Um, you can put stuff in production. I would actually leave it empty because it's. I find it's better to go ahead and put that stuff in the Heroku environment variables. The problem with putting anything in this file is remember that it's checked into source control. So anything you put in here is visible to any of the develop anyone who has access to the code, right? Okay. So that would not be private, right? So as it stands, there's no reason for us to use any of those two. Yeah, I would, for the most part, leave development and production. I would leave both of those empty um, because it's better to use environment. It's it. It turns out it's basically. 90% of the time, it's better to use the in, set those environment variables in the production environment um, rather than putting them in the code. Oh, do they have to have the literal values in there? Huh? For development and production, do you put like literal values? Yeah, you would have to put it in here. Oh, okay. Right. So if I was going to put like my, my in production, my password's not going to obviously be password, right? Yeah. Um, but if I put my database password in here, well, then it wouldn't be private, right? Because, like, I've got this this repo is a public repo, right? Anybody can download the code. Um, or even if it was a private repo, anybody that's on my development team can go download the code. So that would mean that they have access to the production data, which I'd really rather not have, not give everybody the, those keys to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also remember that in um, in Git, you remember that you can go back in the history. There's this time machine. You can go back in the log. Well, as it turns out, if I were to ever put those keys in production, say I go open timeline, I could though go back in the history and see those keys. Even if I put them in and then remove them in a later change set. They're still there permanently in the log in Git. Does do you understand that? Yeah. So someone could just go back and find them. Go back and find them. So, like realistically, if I were to ever accidentally put these in here, if I were to accident accidentally put some secrets into a production file, I'd have to like pull them out and go change all those numbers, change all those passwords. No thing. They're no longer no, secure. 
So the answer is no, you really don't want to put anything in the production file. You want to leave that one empty. Okay. Mr. Smith? Yep. Can't you get ignore that file? Ignore that file? You could. The problem with doing that is then it's never checked in, and the problem is that um, your code then, your application doesn't run without it. So, oh, for okay. instance, if I were to delete this file, so I'm going to delete it and, and restart the server. Yeah, it's going to cause an error. Um, it's that. more than likely going to cause an error. Yeah. So it hasn't caused an error yet because I'm not referring to the config. Um, but if I go to try to say log in, um, that should have failed. I think it's because it's in oh, development mode. That's why it didn't fail. Oh, right. So it wasn't looking for it because of that. So let me delete that file too. Well, wouldn't that wouldn't make sense though? Because like if they're in development mode, they shouldn't be in production. It still complained. They may have changed the way config works. You might not need those files anymore. Um, let me kill the server. And it's probably just here. grabbing the default environment variables right now. Yeah. That's why. So that's why it's probably why it's working. It actually looks like it's working without them now. Um, that did not used to be the case. So they may have actually changed something on the. They may have changed something on the. Um, config side I think uh, Mr. Smith what it's doing is probably grabbing the default environment variables out of the system that's what I would well what I would expect it would fall down to the other files if I don't include I if I don't include development or production I would assume it would I, that would be the nice thing it would just assume it's an empty file like that um, but I just remember I've I can't remember where and when but I remember at some point I was using that and it complained about them not being there so it doesn't seem to be doing that anymore, but I remember it used to. So. Um, one of the things you can do though, um, one of the tricks you might do, um, I do have this secret in here in the default. Um, that does allow it go to potentially to be accidentally used in production. So sometimes the more secure thing to do with that one would be to actually put that into the development file. So I might put in the development file as salt rounds 10 secret secrets in there, and then maybe I would, you know, remove this, right? So then the default file doesn't have a, like you have to set the secret. Does that make sense? That's okay. Putting it in development and not default. But I would avoid putting anything in the production file. Whatever you were just talking about was way over my head. I, I okay. just know okay. that that's what's in there and you know, I'll just kind of let it be at that. Yeah. It's it's one of those it's it's one of those things where you know from a security standpoint it it really matters a lot the way you set up your configuration because you know if that secret is so important that it's it's really what's keeping your site secure um, then you you do really care about it right okay. what, how many salt rounds would a big what, big company use like ten is plenty oh ten is plenty so a big company usually uses ten. Like Facebook and everything. Ten is ten is honestly enough, and it's probably more than you need. Um, it may seem like oh, okay. a it may seem like a relatively small number, but it's actually already a lot. Um, remember, the point is that it the the higher that number is, the slower it is to do it, uh, which actually means the the higher that number of salt rounds is, the slower it is to log in. Um, if I were to push that up to 20, you saw how slow it made it. Well, that would mean that users click the login button and they have to wait, right, until that finishes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, I don't want to really set that too high. It seemed like 15 was the highest that it would go and, and not really um, be terribly slow. Um, but, but 10 is really fine. 
as it turns out. Uh, but I put that there as a configuration piece so that you can potentially change it to be something else in production if you needed to. It You can kind of tune it once you've got your, your site up and running that way. Okay. Um, so going back here, um, so we got the payload, remember, and that's from the user object. Um, basically, I'm pulling off some pieces from the database to save. Um, I've got my secret, which came from my configuration, and then I'm finally creating my token. Um, depending on, this is actually also something you might want to put into your config. Honestly, I forgot to do that, um, but you may want to consider putting your the time there as a config variable as well. Um, so like I'm saying this expires in an hour, I might want that to be something I configure in, in the auth section as well. Um, so can you just saying, do that right now, and then huh? we can download it again? I think we can. Um, the catch is that I've got it in two different formats, right? So I've got the age of the the cookie here calculated out, and I've got the token set as expires in one hour, right? Those I kind of want to keep in sync. Um, Mr. Smith. So I may have to change it to milliseconds. Yep. Is there any way? Is there any way to change, like, convert the milliseconds so, like, you can use like str string format? Is there a module? Uh, what do you so, mean? Like a millisecond, like you can put, like mm -hmm. in the GWT, you can do one hour, but like since cookies is milliseconds, can you do anything like that? It it has to be you no, know, it has to be as as that. Yeah, because um, I remember when I was telling you about the days. Mm -hmm. It's like a couple million. It's like eight hundred seventy-five yeah. million milliseconds. Now I would wonder moment. That's moment what I was thinking too. Moment has good, something. Moment JS might be a place to look at. I know they do times. I I can't remember if they do time spans like that. Um, so I'd have to go look. Cause that oh, there's durations. Um, uh, maybe. Um, so there I can say two space seconds. They say they have a shorthand. So can I specify that shorthand the same way is kind of the question. So humanize, duration, humanize. But it doesn't look like they take it in. It doesn't look like moment takes it in potentially as the same format. Because I don't see a way to put it in as... I don't see any of their examples at least show it as, as taking it as 1H, for instance. Speaking of time, too, uh, mm -hmm. how would we... Maybe we could work on this if there's enough time, but yeah, with login, okay, yeah, you're checking all this stuff, but you also want to keep track of the the time that they log in. And mm -hmm. I know uh, working with date time local and, and trying to get that to play nice and all that, that's just, uh, I find it confusing. That, that would help to see that in action. Um, I think if you look at the cowboy boots, you'll see all the pieces. I believe yeah. I put all the pieces into place there. Um, but basically all you have to do is is update the database, right? So I need to call, make a call to the, the database here, right, to update the user, right? Right, yeah, you would update the... The last login. Well, yeah, that, that, that brings up another question, though, because we're using a post, right? Isn't this a mm -hmm. post? Okay. We already have existing information in there, right? So uh, um, I'm a little bit confused over post or put for something like this because we have an existing user. We're not posting anything. It's already in the database, right? Right. So the, it's a form. The, the right. Time. So it's a form. So I'm doing post and I'm not doing any Ajax in here. I'm not calling an, uh, a REST API. This example here I did without 
without Ajax. Okay, I'm I'm not getting what that has to do with it right at this second, but I'm just well. That's like, that's why it's blogging. because I'm not doing Ajax is why it's a post. Okay, you mean you only use put with Ajax? Yeah, you'd only use put if you're doing an Ajax request to a REST API. Oh, I didn't know that. So yeah. in our function, like what you're writing right there, it would be. Mm -hmm. Just so it'd be like be update, uh, last, login, um, and then it, what I would need is um, like the user ID. Yeah, the, the, okay. Yeah, you identify it with that, and then we'll update. It, mm -hmm. It's just the time, right? There'd be nothing else. Cause, uh, right, the it would just be that. So I would need to say, let's let's update... Um, dot where um, the ID is user ID and then basically I just need to set the um, the time to the current one I have an extra greater than here um, so I would need to say like last login would be Yeah, I, I'm getting that. The the hang up that I got is the, mm -hmm. the format. I, I just remember having a lot right. of in, in trouble with that. And mm -hmm. I was looking at the way things are stored in MySQL, where it's in this uh, <clears throat> something like YYYY hyphen mm -hmm. MM hyphen DD THH colon mm colon ss it's got to be in that format and right it, it just wasn't working i was just yep so yeah, so now, if i do moment like this let me i need to actually import moment i just went and installed it but i need to still import it um const moment is equal to require moment so I bring in the moment library um, so I need to set it to the current time. So moment with parentheses there is the current time. Um, if I pass other things into there, I can I can do a conversion to a moment object, but that gives me the current time. Does that follow so far? Uh, sure. I'm just so, curious if it's in the right format. Yep. So you just say formatted into the right format. Take the current time, uh, format it into whatever it needs to be. Right. So yeah. So, that would so what's the format for MySQL? I believe you would type capital YYYY hyphen MM hyphen. I think it has to be capitalized. So I'm, maybe uh, you know better. I don't think so. I don't think for the year that it has to be. I think that's only for time. Yeah, I think that matters for like the month. There's a difference between the M's because one lowercase okay. m is different than uppercase m, but I believe that lowercase y versus uppercase y is the same. Um, okay. Display format. Um, so if I look at, yeah, so, Okay, well, maybe I do want to use the uppercase ones, at least according to their documentation, so I can. Um, okay. um, year, month. But usually it doesn't matter. Um, year, month. Month does need to be uppercase because lowercase m is minute. Um, right. And then day of, day, week, day of week. Um, you see you've got lowercase d is day of week, uppercase d is day of month. I think you want uh, capital D. I want D, capital D, D, D there. Capital D. Yeah. So I want capital D there. And then I would need the hour. Right? What's the difference between just 1D and 2? 1D and 2. Um, well, look at 1D. That's what 1D looks like. This is what oh, 2D oh, looks like. So it... it, it pads it with zeros and that's what you want for the the formatting there is you need it to be zero padded 
Um, While so that's we're in this part here, uh, something else that I, I saw mm -hmm. was relevant in some way is a mm -hmm. T that's between the date and the hour. Okay. You can't just put a space in there. It, I had a, a huge amount of time trying mm -hmm. to update something and get it to work right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can't even put it to words how it is, but it, I just know that that was part of it. Mm -hmm. The way date, time, local, and the way uh, MySQL does it, mm -hmm. it's not so compatible. Yeah. So you do you do have to define your format specifically yourself. Um, you can't use one of the baked in. There's not one of the baked in versions that works. Um, so you do have to define it specifically. Um, which actually is it's it's going to be this because it turns out most of the most formatting libraries are pretty similar. Um, so you see, they want it specifically as um, it has to be that and the the hour, the minute, second with a space. You're right. So it has to be a space. Um, so to in, in, in put in a space, you really just put in a space. So I'm going to okay. put in a space yeah, there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I know it's I've had lowercase h's, but I think you want capital H's because that differentiates between AM and PM. It's military mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And it, it will, yeah. You don't need AM and PM. It's just right. makes it. So if you look at their format here, they say from this to that, you'll notice in the format it specifies 23. So that means that they're expecting it, yes, in in military time and 24 hour and a 24 hour clock, um, and they don't have an AM PM. So yeah, according to my according to the um, documentation on moment, a lowercase h is 12 hours. You see it goes from 1 to 12 versus uppercase H is, is zero to 23. So yeah, you have to pay it. You do have to pay attention to little details like that. But that's it. Okay. Will it work? Do we have enough in there to yeah. see it working? Um, I have to add a column to the database um, because I don't have a last, uh, last login column in the database. So I can go do that. Date, time, and I'm going to allow it to be null because I don't have any last login dates in there at all. So let me refresh this. Tables. Um, so if I look at the data in there right now, none of these users have a lost login date. Right. Um, so okay. now I can I can I can hook that up. So I've got that method that updates it. I just need to go back to account. And so in this case, we know we got through successfully. We've got a good um, user. I just need to go to the database and until it's updated. So quant. Um, I might actually do it down here because I don't need I can do this after words so I might say await DB dot update last login and pass in the user dot ID so once it's done all that go ahead and update the last login let me try to log in now So oh, I think my server's not running. I need to get it up and running again. Nodemon, there we go. Okay, so hit login, check the database, and there's my login date. Yeah, oh, awesome. Uh, so, you didn't store that <clears throat> when you did the await, you didn't use a, a const for that. Is there any reason why? Just unnecessary or? How would you verify that with debug otherwise? Um, because honestly, I don't care what the result is. I okay, you just verify it with it seeing it working. You would need yeah. to see it in the yeah. panel at all. Otherwise, yeah. you would need to, though. Yeah, that's that's basically the gist of it. I don't really care um, whether it failed or succeeded. 
is what it comes down to it. In fact, I could just say, um, because I don't care, I, well, I guess I do have to say a wait to get it to actually run it um, to initiate the query, but I technically don't even need to wait for the result because I'm not going to do anything with it. So that's, that's why okay. I'm not saving it to a variable because I don't care about the result. Okay, great demo, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to this question, I, it looks to me at least um, that moment doesn't take a duration in terms of that, but I could be wrong. So I might try, um, let's bring in moment in here. So if I wanted to have the, um, duh, 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 bring in moment. So it looked like it was moment dot duration. So let's see what happens if I say moment uh, dot duration. And let's give it um, one H. Let's see if that would give us the same result. And then I want to turn it back to milliseconds. So looking at durations, can I get back to the number of milliseconds there? Ah, so there's an as milliseconds, which is what I need. So let's say I try that. If it does work, then it should go through fine but it looks like it didn't. So something's not. Why does it say missing token? We don't have a cookie being issued. Uh, what was wrong with the way it was before? Why not just do it that way and move on? I mean, well, what we're trying hard. to do, the question was, can we take that and put it into a configuration? You mean just to have it like a default where you don't need to worry about it? Well, yeah, can we put it in the configuration and have it be in the same format? So could we put it in the configuration as 1H and then that populate both things? Um, that was the question. So moment. what I'm going to do is just create another JS file so we can play around with it. So const moment is equal to require moment and then let's do this ms is equal to that console dot log ms let's see what that does so in uh, node mon moment duration. So that seems to be giving me zero. You can see that. So it looks like moment really wants it in the format of two arguments. You can see that. Does that partially answer your question, Mo? So because moment wants it in, it can't take it in the same format. Um, I can't just put it in the config as 1H. 
um, unless I did some more string manipulation with it. Uh, because I could still break this up and say, well, let's break the one and the HOP into two different arguments um, using a regex. So I could do that. Um, but I think that it's probably easier to go and put that number in and have that number be the one we use. So for instance, if I was going to put that in the configuration, I would probably just put that number there. So you're right. It's easier. Yeah. So I might say um, expires milliseconds. Or just expires. Because then I could use that value um, on the other side. So if I put that in there, expires. I mean, the problem is in, to put it in here, I, I can't put math. Um, so it has to be that way. Uh, da, 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 control C, stop that, no bond. So I could put it in that way, and then I'd have to come back here and get them both to the same thing. So I might say const expires is equal to um, config.get auth.expires. So obviously this value I can put in here directly as max age. Um, but then I have to say, well, how do I put in this? Um, I can probably put it in, I can, I'm going to expect I can probably put it in directly um, as a number. Let's see what happens if I do that. Um, it looks like that went through. Okay. Um, so it looks like the, the, you can see the cookie expires at 1554. Do you see that? Yeah. Um, let's take this and run it into here. And it spits it out as expires at this time, which is, um, it says 554. 554 at minus 6 GMT. So is that the same time? Is that the same time as the other route, other calculation? Because here I have, I mean, obviously there's a discrepancy because this is minus 5, and this is showing it as minus 6. So that should be an hour off, but why is it 5 versus 15? Oh, that said December 8th. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, this one also says, yeah, so this one says October 27th. Um, so that one's definitely not right. So I might need to do plus ms. I see what you're trying to do, but I don't see it adding that much value. Yeah. It's just a matter of if you want it to be configurable um, from the, like you want it to be able to config, configure it in production is the thing. So yeah, changing I, that, if you, want, if you want to be able to change that window without having to change the code. Um, and that looks like it worked. 1555 there, October 27th, and 1555 here. So as long as we can get that to work, that would be the preferred option. Yeah, I mean, that would be one way to do it. I, I'm fine with you doing it this way. Okay, these changes you're making, are you going to update that so we can pull it down? Yeah, I'll, I will update. I will push those things up. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to go ahead and comment that back out. But just, you know, so you can see that what, that would be the way to, that would be to put it in the config. Mr. Smith? Yep. Whenever we use cookies, don't we, don't we have to have a disclaimer to the users? Um, from... 
If you have European clients, yes. If you don't have European clients, then no. Why is that? I know we can you can do stuff, but like, but like, why? Like, why do we have to tell them that we're using cookies to store their login information? Um, you have to you have to tell them you're using cookies for anything. It doesn't matter what you're using the cookies for. Um, Isn't just European law? It's a European law. I forget the name of it, um, but it's even if if you're doing things like, for instance, um, Google has an analytics thing that you can use to track page views and such, um, and it's basically a script you add, but um, Google requires, um, Google uses a cookie to keep, keep track of who you are. So even if you just add in Google Analytics and your screen is just, and you don't have any sort of login stuff, that's already a cookie. It doesn't even have to be your cookie. Does that follow? But I've seen it before where like, it literally says if you're using this website, you agree to our, you agree to our cookies. Yeah. But as that's... long as you're on the website, you agree automatically in the it's like whenever they check the terms of service whenever they register it's actually tipping it it actually per the eu law it has to be even before that it has to be the first time you it has to be immediately when you visit the website it even on the home page is the eu regulation again i don't remember the specific eu regulation about that uh, but that's a that's an eu law uh, so you can just put it at the very bottom in like little small text. This website uses cookies. Well, it it's that's usually where they put it in is is down at the bottom in kind of a floating. Because it's the users, it's the users' uh, responsibility to know that. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that they know that. Yeah, but like like sometimes you know what I mean it's, it, as long as it's on the website somewhere they it's kind of their they they kind of have to look for it, right or no. Oh, there it is. GDPR. That's the name of it. Um, if you look up GDPR, you'll find that. Okay. General Data Pro Protection Regulation. Um, that's that's the that's the regulation that made all that happen and it looks like it says it came out in 2018 so uh, that's what has meant that there's all the pop-ups about cookies is gdpr i remember it's somewhere in there which is a very long long regulation all in all it doesn't seem that hard to implement just a warning so should we just get into the habit of it um, you can, you can. Um, it's it's something you can play around with and see how to how to do it. Um, it's not something I'm going to require you to do for this course. Okay. Um, but it technically, as long as you're not, it, it technically it only applies in the EU. the The catch is that it applies if um, the the person who's visiting your website lives in the EU. It's not if your company is in the EU. Um, but if the person who's visiting it is in the EU, um, which because the problem is it's not very easy um, to tell which country your view your user is in. Um, that's where that's where most sites end up showing it to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Even though it's only enforceable in the EU. Um, so it's just a good practice all in all. It's a good practice all in all. Um, you know, basically what can happen, even though you live in the U.S. and maybe your company is in the U.S., as it turns out, the, the EU can still sue you. Oh. Uh, they can still sue you. They can still sue your company if, uh, if you're not following GDP regulations for your users that are in Europe, which is the, the weird catch. So you can still get fined on GDPR regulations, even though all your business is, even if all your business is in um, America, all you have to have is one one customer that lives in the EU, and you don't follow the regulations for them. That's that's enough to get you a fine. So. 
basically you end up having to treat all your customers as if they're in the EU. It's the is the bad thing. Does that follow? Yeah. It's it's kind of a mess. <laughs> in my opinion cuz it's like that it it has turned out that the GDPR has a lot broader reach than just the EU and and um I think that it's it's one of those things that kind of shows maybe a fault in international law when it comes to web development because it's like well okay if this company can if this country can decide here's the rules for my citizens and tell me i have to enforce that uh okay so i i have rules that i have to follow for not just my home country america i've got to follow the your european regulations and if i've got anybody from china i've got to follow all the chinese regulations if I've got anybody from Japan, I've got to make sure I'm complying to Japanese law. Um, yeah. If you have a physical location, right, obviously you only have to follow the laws of the nation you're in. But if you have a, a website, your website is kind of a citizen of the global, the global community, you now have to follow the laws from every country, um, which is gay. So, um, let's see. So we looked at the, the way the login works. Um, I think in my slides, I did show how the, um, the user part of that work, the, the other side of that. So if we look at the account, see, that's all I'm doing to pull out the account information. Um, I'm just saying, well, it's already in the middleware, pulls it out and puts in request.user. So I don't have to do anything fancy in my route to get that information. Cool. Yeah, sounds cool. Um, so what all did I change? Um, uh, how did you do that real quick where you saw the working tree? I've seen that pop up by accident on my part. What do you but mean I, by I working, working tree? Where I, where I saw the highlights in the green and all oh, that. Oh, I'm in, if you see the branch, that's source control. Okay. Um, so in source control, it's showing me all the files that have changed. And so I can go to each of these, you. and so it will show me what's changed from the last time I committed. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Right, so I can see, for instance, that I added, added a way to track the last login. Um, so if I was going to kind of bundle those together... I would say, well, I need the last login as part of that. I need the schema change. I need the database. I need um, this change. I also had to add moment. And because I had to add moment, I need to add my package lock.json. Um, so all of those changes basically have to do with um, Adding last login logic. So I can check all those things in. And then I've got a few things left. So the hope is that that, you know, this example will kind of fill in some of those, basically some of those gaps where the theory kind of fits together. How does that apply? So. Questions? Nope. Uh, no. Okay. Um, so we'll definitely have, a, I think, so tomorrow's a lab day for sure, for Wednesday. Um, I believe Thursday will also be a lab day. I think I have a few things in terms of, you know, security and these kind of pieces that we still would like to talk about. Um, I've got a, I had originally had it in here and I, I pulled it out. I've got another set of slides that I was working on for talking about 
application state and some of the other ways that you can store this data um, and pass it around other than using cookies. Um, so I, I think I'll push that. You know, it, it we'll probably go over that next week um, with some other things as they come up, other bits and pieces. So, but that I think should give you enough to be able to build your login screens and make them secure, and build your authentication stuff, including hashing passwords and such. Um, if you right. look at the mastery grading rubric, one of the expectations from the user management side, um, let me actually pull that up uh, and let's see things that we've covered, um, is that you, the, you should have the stuff that we have in here, but you should also have a way to actually manage users as well. Um, so functionality that should be in there are things like um, password reset and, and, and tools to edit your account and things like that. Uh, let me go down to user accounts. Um, so error handling, we've talked about how to do that with um, We've talked about how to build that error middleware for the 500 errors and the 404 errors. Uh, authentication, we've talked about how to do that with JWT tokens now. Um, there's some additional information kind of on the step four here of like, okay, also going into and looking at OAuth for some of the other APIs, um, which you can, you can use JWT in here as well. Um, so they can use like a, um, you can use OAuth in here to have like a, a Facebook login, um, but both of those routes end up giving you a JWT token. Um, so there's there's that in there we haven't looked at. Um, register pages we've looked at. Authorization we still need to talk about and user management. Yeah, Mr. Smith, in general, uh -huh. what, what you present in the lecture is that gets us to level three and then level four is kind of like yes. an independent study if we want to do it kind of thing, right? To go above in, and beyond. In, in general, what, what the lectures will do is get you to level three. The level four is, yes, something you I would expect you to do as independent study. Now, not to say that you can't ask me questions on the level four, and I'll be happy to ask answer those things and, and talk to you about those, but I'm not going to give the entire class a lecture on level four um, because that would be over the over the head for, for some people. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank so you. I'm, I'm getting you up to level three. Um, level four is, is largely a self-study, but it, you can still ask me questions on it because um, I do know some things about I, how to do that. Um, it just you know, not going to be where, you know, my lecture is not going to be all the way up to that level four because that's the, the over and above, right? Exceeding expectation kind of idea. Um, 